My name is Rona Nadler. I'm the harpsichordist with Infusion Baroque, and today I'm going to be talking about French harpsichordist and composer Elisabeth Claude Jacquet de la Guerre. She was born into a large family of musicians, instrument makers, and other artisans. Her family was connected through marriage, by blood, and also through godparents to various other musical dynasties that almost monopolized the professional musical life of Paris. Her father was an organist, her two brothers were also organists who held major church positions in Paris, and her sister Anne was a harpsichordist who played in an ensemble in the royal household. Elizabeth was clearly the most talented of her siblings. Uh, her father was most likely her first keyboard teacher, and when she was five years old, he took her to the court of Louis XIV to perform for the king, and the king was so impressed with her that he brought her into the royal household and had her educated in the household of his then mistress, Madame de Montespan. Elizabeth was raised in this incredibly exciting uh, and rich musical atmosphere of Louis XIV's French court. She was particularly renowned as a performer and specifically as an improviser. Part of being a professional keyboard player in the 18th century, whether you were an organist or a harpsichordist, uh, was being able to improvise. In the context of organ music, that would mean improvising in church. As a harpsichordist, the most famous improvised genre was called the prélude non mesuré, the unmeasured prelude, which means with no real rhythm. And the art of the unmeasured prelude is to have unexpected harmonic shifts and to have a very interesting and sort of surprising harmony. Elizabeth was apparently uh, an expert at improvising in this form. It was said later in her life that she could sit and improvise on a theme for a half hour or more and her, her listeners would be transfixed. The Chacon in A minor is part of a larger suite of harpsichord pieces in A minor. It's a typical Baroque dance suite. Uh, it's a bit of a, a serious or, or dramatic chacon. It's in a minor key. Chacons uh, often, especially if they're in a major key, are quite light and, and graceful and very charming. I almost liken it to uh, sort of the, the pop music of the Baroque. They often have a kind of a very feel-good kind of hook to them. Uh, but this chacon, it's, it's, a, it's a great and catchy piece, but it's a little bit more uh, restrained. Elizabeth lived at the court of Louis XIV from the age of five until the age of 19 when she got married to Marin de la Guerre, who was also an organist, and together they moved from the court back to Paris where they pursued their respective careers. Uh, they had a child together in 1694. It also happens to be the year in which Elizabeth uh, had her first and only opera performed at the Académie Royale de Musique, which is the predecessor of the present-day uh, Paris National Opera. So that was a very uh, fruitful year for her. Her opera was called Cephal et Procris, and she had royal patronage for this performance. It seems that maybe it was not the most popular opera at the time. Uh, it didn't get very many repeat performances, and critiques of the opera tended to say that it maybe didn't have the best libretto. It had a very convoluted and complicated plot, even by the standards of Baroque opera. Uh, but the music is wonderful, and uh, the opera has been performed and recorded in modern times. In the next decade, she continued to perform and to compose uh, and to teach, including uh, teaching her young son, who was also a gifted harpsichordist. Uh, unfortunately, her son passed away suddenly at the age of 10 in 1704, and just a few months later, her husband died as well. Uh, her life at that point changed completely. She moved into an apartment of her own in Paris, in the neighborhood that she had grown up in, and uh, from that point on, she continued to support herself as a composer, as a performer, as a teacher. And she also hosted salon concerts in her home, which became very popular. And this was part of a sort of a revolution in Paris and in Europe from uh, the royal patronage system, where you really needed a royal or aristocratic patron in order to be a professional musician to uh, a model based more on public concerts in which the growing middle class could also uh, come see and hear classical music. 
one area that was not open to women musicians at the time was to hold an official court post. So it's sort of the equivalent of saying that women could be uh, freelancers or you know, adjuncts, uh, but they could never have the, the full-time salaried job with benefits at the court, say. Uh, and so that really did limit women's options in terms of their professional lives and their ability to have uh, stability as artists. And so a lot of women, their careers would effectively be over when they got married or they were dependent in some way on a man for support. Uh, but in the case of Elizabeth, she did enjoy this royal patronage uh, up until the death of Louis XIV in 1715. She sort of had, I guess, an entrepreneurial spirit, and she never remarried. For the rest of her life, she was able to support herself as a musician, as a composer, teacher, performer. And I find that really remarkable, that she was like a full uh, professional musician in her own right, who uh, made a living at it and was really an independent woman artist.